night, we're hearing from the architecture graduates. Uh, everyone here has participated in the Tuesday talks, so you may already know um, them or their names are familiar. So it's Chad Kellogg, Jennifer Preston, Randall Stone, who is joining us in a little bit, and Karen Kuby. Ruth Benjamin, the Vice President of the GSAP Alumni Board, will be moderating. So I think let's start by asking everyone to give their brief introduction, their class year program, and what it was like when they were graduating and what their concerns were. And then um, sort of wrap up your introduction by talking about where you are now. And then, and then Ruth can follow up with some questions on your strategies. Uh, let's start with Chad. Thanks, Lisa. Um, so I graduated in 2008 uh, at Mark and um, kind of the last big recession. Um, I uh, was working at um, a small architecture firm that went from 15 people when I graduated and started there to about five people um, within about six months. And then over the four years that I worked there, the office grew back to about 15 people. So we kind of weathered that last recession. Um, and I think we did it through creativity and also just luck. I think the firm had a diverse group of projects. So some of them went away and some of them kept going. Um, I started my own practice with a friend of mine uh, about four years ago. And we have had a great four years. And now we're kind of bracing for what's to come. And so I'm really happy to be here with everyone and kind of help think this through and give you my advice, but also um, you know, talk to my colleagues about future, so. Uh, Karen, you wanna go next? Sure, hi, yeah, I'm Karen Kuby and um, Leslie, amazing, almost no one pronounces my name correctly, so thank you for doing that. Um, I graduated with an NLARC in 2009, and this is what I remember. So this was back before you had amazing people um, like, like Leslie, you know, um, doing this important job in a professional capacity. Um, in our day, there was um, a student, bless his heart, our friend Michael, my classmate, who was trying to organize career stuff. Um, poor guy, doing his best. So, so the scene was that, you know, there was career day, that had been set up, but he was having such a hard time getting any firms to show up. And I actually didn't even go. It seemed like it was obviously gonna be a waste because there were no jobs. Um, but I had colleagues who went and literally, you know, they showed up and they met with whatever firm and the firm said, oh, PS, we're not actually hiring. We just thought it would be fun to see your portfolio. So it was a dark time. And, um, and it was right after this, you know, this amazing moment where we thought that we could do anything. And I was working at a firm called Rex and there were no budgets. It was sky's the limit. Anyway, so that was the vibe. And um, I think today I will not be sharing, you know, brilliant strategies that I used on purpose that worked beautifully. I'm just gonna tell you what happened and maybe you'll learn something. Um, so thinking back to that moment, I actually was being sort of anti-strategic. I was very busy with school, trying to finish my studio projects and everything. Um, so I thought, you know what, I'm not gonna deal with the real world. And my vision for myself was that I would use the recession as an excuse to move to Paris and be a bohemian. Mm -hmm. That was literally the plan <laughs> that I had. Um, but then, I was ignoring all this stuff because it seemed like a real nightmare and I was just gonna wait till I graduated. Um, but then what happened was um, a job fell in my lap, um, a colleague, so, so I'm in Portland now and I'll talk about that in a second, but I, I um, for 16 years, um, lived in New York, including 
a few years before I started uh, at Columbia. So a colleague I knew previously uh, recruited me for a job in disaster housing planning. Um, and I ended up saying yes to that. Um, and um, it changed my whole career path. Um, it was a job where I made, at the time, a lot of money. Um, I had a lot of responsibility. There were a lot of amazing things about it. I'll talk more about it, um, but it wasn't directly architecture and I haven't done directly architecture since. So there are, you can look at that as expanded practice or you can look at that as a derailed career. I think it's, you can look at it either way. Um, so so I've, um, I've done since then a lot of different work in housing from a lot of different, um, and also before grad school from a lot of different directions, including um, editorial work, um, leading nonprofit called the Institute for Public Architecture um, in New York. And I'm now um, in a fellowship that I'm super excited about. It's the first year that the University of Oregon has had a fellowship in design for spatial justice. So I'm one of uh, six faculty fellows hired for the first year to do a combination of research and teaching, looking at what, um, how we can approach concepts of spatial justice. So thanks for inviting me. I'm looking forward to your questions. Thanks, Karen. And, and let's hear from Jennifer before Ruth starts uh, diving more deeply into everyone's experience. I am um, a co-founder, partner at Shelter. I graduated also in 2008, May of 2008. Um, at that point in the world, I think there was a lot of sense that things were getting to be hard, slowing down, jobs weren't as plentiful. But it wasn't really until September of that same year um, when Lehman Brothers crashed. I'm not sure everybody remembers that as much as I do, but I, I certainly remember it very clearly. Um, and the whole world kind of exploded. And that, you know, a few short months after I had finished three years of a master's program and devoted a lot of, a lot of effort and a lot of money and um, a lot of student loans to that, to that adventure. And it was terrifying. It was really scary. Um, a lot of friends, you know, I remember going to breakfast with friends and, and nobody could find work and we were all incredibly talented, very well trained, you know, ready to work people. Um, but since then, you know, they've all, all each of us have kind of taken paths and I, I love, I love the way um, the panels before me phrased it as like, you know, intentional or derailed, who knows, and it doesn't really matter, but it's all good. Um, and and I've traveled through a lot of different kind of accidental and on purpose decisions, and I, I feel really like zero regrets about any of it. Um, but I can talk about it more in detail as we move forward. Great. And Ruth, tell us a little bit about um, your experience and what you're doing now. Sure. Um, uh, really quickly, is Randall joining a little bit later? Yes. Okay. Yes. So we can just go ahead and start now. Great. Okay. Hi, everyone. I'm Ruth Benjamin. I graduated in 2010. Um, I was at the tail end of the, the recession. So I remember feeling the tangible fear that Jennifer and Karen were in the middle of, and Chad were in the middle of when they, when they all started looking for jobs. Um, so uh, I ended up taking three jobs, um, all with like pay that was probably not what I was worth, but like it was good to get a foot in the door, especially in New York. Um, and then luckily that all kind of uh, led to all sorts of opportunities in landscape architecture, urban design, um, traditional architecture. So I, I've been very fortunate. Uh, currently I'm an architect at uh, architect and I'm part of the in-house design team at Industry City. So it's been an interesting process thinking about how we go forward um, on our campus, if you're familiar with it, it's a, well, sort of like a mini WeWork. So we're thinking about how we manage new tenants coming in, um, hygiene, um, all sorts of issues that we hadn't necessarily thought all the way through before. So this is uh, unprecedented. So I'm very excited to talk to all of the panelists and hope that we provide something useful, even though this is a 
very different set of circumstances. But, um, I think that segues kind of into my first question for you guys. Um, and I, I was going to start with um, with Jennifer, but you got, you guys can all um, chime in. But the first question I had was, what's the best advice that you received um, upon graduating from uh, GSAP and like starting your potential career in the midst of sort of really difficult mm -hmm. circumstances? And if you did receive advice. Yeah, I know. I, I think that the best piece of advice, and I still practice this now, you know, so many years in, is um, go to meetings in different groups, especially if you're still in New York City or in any major metropolitan area. I currently live in like very rural Vermont, so there's not a lot going on. But there's not a lot going on anywhere right now, but it's okay. Um, but, you know, I... I was a little bit reluctant when I graduated from Columbia. I think I was a bit of a snob, to be very honest. I was like, well, I don't want to go to a, like a mechanical engineering group, or I don't want to go to a sustainability group, or I don't want to go to a, a trade floor, or you know, it just felt like it wasn't something that I saw myself doing in my career. I really was like, I want to design stuff. I want to be an architect. I had an idea in my head, and you got to let those ideas go um, and just let things happen a little bit and. So I went to a lot of different groups. I went to the AIA Coke Committee. I started to participate in different committees and get to know different people who are in really incredible positions in New York City. Um, and my network just exploded. I had I had people everywhere, all over the city that I knew and that knew me. And that continues to help me today. Um, it introduced me to a group of the top 50 largest architecture firms in the country have a small group of sustainable design leaders that get together every year. And I'm still part of that group. We're having a cocktail hour tomorrow night. And they, they're they doing incredible work all over the globe. They're thinking about sustainable design at the edge. And I just drink with them. <laughs> and it's the best thing ever. Um, and, and if I hadn't, if I, you know, if I had refused to go to some of these like quote unquote groups or clubs that I thought I was too good for, I wouldn't know these wonderful people and I, I wouldn't have what I have. So that's my advice. Okay. Be open. Um, Chad, I'd, Chad and Karen, I'd like to ask you the same question. So Chad first. Yeah. Um, I think something, uh, similar along those lines of, um, I think somebody, said uh, be flexible and um, I think that helped me in my first um, couple of months working as the I actually got hired before Lehman Brothers um, collapsed and so the office had a very different trajectory and um, but but in short order 10 people had to leave the office and I think it was just kind of being willing to like do whatever, you know, I was kind of hired to be a designer, but I was, you know, doing technical things. I was getting coffee. I think I was, I was able to keep my job because I was just kind of always busy and always trying to find something to do. And I think this is a, something that now that I have my own firm um, and we're having to make some hard decisions, I feel like the, the people who are team players and who are just kind of up for whatever and are going to be um, kind of consigliere, you know, like going to just keep going, even if it's a little bit boring or we're taking on a project that's not super exciting. Uh, and you kind of know, you, you can trust them to, to kind of go that extra mile. I think that kind of attitude can be really helpful in a recession because when everything's good and um, firms are bidding for the top designers and you can bounce from one firm to another, it's a very different environment than if, you're just trying to keep the job you have. And they almost take two different approaches um, or two different skill sets. So I think um, finding ways to be indispensable and being flexible were you know, useful at that time. And I bet they'll be useful in the next six months or a year. Right, I think that like, uh, I found the same thing that being resilient in that way made you have to be flexible and then is only serving the better at this point and then it only becomes easier at some point too so hopefully it, of course there's ebb and flow but um that, that's what i found too thanks chad karen 
Okay. Um, I do not remember any advice from that moment. It was really a blur and really s- stressful. So I don't remember. I blocked that out. But I do remember um, Chad and I both went to Berkeley. And so I came to New York right after graduating. And I, um, I'm i dating myself, but I think I like used a phone. Um, I, called, <laughs> I called our alumni person and that person put me in touch with a few Berkeley alumni in New York. And so, you know, I'm 22 and um, like my second week in New York, I show up in the office of Ronette Riley on the 80th floor of the Empire State Building. And um, she looks at my like (laughs) garbage portfolio and she says, you're never gonna get a job. Um, (laughs) Because anyway, I, you know, I had worked at a summer camp. I didn't know what was going on. she said, you're never going to get a job. And then she turned it around and she, she was like, how much is your rent? And she started to calculate what I needed to make. And then she wrote down, she wrote down the addresses for the Architectural League and the AIA. And so again, I'm dating myself, but I think I physically went to these places, which is something we used to do. We used to physically go to places. So I physically went to these places. I said, hey, I don't know what's happening. I'm 22. Ronette told me to show up. And so similar to what Jennifer is talking about, um, again, it's, I'm not going to tell you great strategic moves I made. I just, um, my career is basically, um, uh, you know, um, doing work uh, around my interests and then having really good luck and saying yes to things. Um, so in this case, I, you know, I volunteered from like, you know, day one, basically in New York at the league and at the AIA. And, um, you know, those, those first days volunteering, which were not trying to get anything. I was just trying to, I was just volunteering, um, led to everything else. Um, and then volunteering with helping to start architecture for humanity, um, is what got me linked up to the job I got in the recession. Um, so, so that's also been, you know, what's, what's happened for me. It's just been uh, over and over again. I've been side by side working with someone on a volunteer project or something. And then later they've given me a call and given me an offer. Great. Um, we also have Randall Stone uh, joining us. So um, Randall, if you could just give a little introduction and then um, we just finished with the first question, but I'd love you to answer it too, which is just, the best advice that you received during um, the time that you graduated and and how you would dispense it to to the rest of us. Sure, I apologize for being late. Um, um, I graduated uh, in 1990 from uh, from Columbia, uh, right into a recession. I was living in Boston at the time and over half the architects had already been laid off. So it was, you know, just absolutely not the best time. Um, uh, but you know, uh, very quickly, uh, I was able to, uh, get a, a, a job, uh, which actually I did practice architecture for many years, but the job that I got was actually working for a firm doing retail design and the retail design business, which wasn't that popular in the architecture space at the time, um, really sent me on the path of, uh, eventually expanding my career into, um, um, going beyond just the architecture and getting into experience design across all kinds of sectors. Um, the best, the best advice I received at the time, uh, well, at the time, as I kind of heard there, it was you had to get out and just perseverance um, and take any job that you could get, uh, that because you know the smallest job turned into the biggest job. Mm-hmm. Great, thank you, you guys. That's um. I think that's great advice and I hope that um, it's useful for everyone. Um, Like feel free to also like, if you have any to interject, but I'm just trying to prop some questions here. Um, The other, uh, another question that I had, which is might actually, um, yeah, I think it actually ties in pretty well is uh, if you knew what you know now, uh, what would you do differently if you um, had to go back? I'll start in the same order. Jennifer, you can go first. 
Man, I was helping somebody else. <laughs> well, we can start with some help. I don't mind. <laughs> um, I, I feel like I want to give this a little bit of thought, but let me just dive in. Uh, I, I, I've heard that question before, and it's like, how can you possibly look back? You know, like all the all the little things that feel like derailments or errors get you where you are. You know, like I, I took a job as a sustainable design um, like consultant doing lead projects. That was my first job out of Columbia. It was not what I was qualified to do. I didn't even have a lead AP. I like <laughs> to I, like study for the exam and, and passed it before my first day, but like I accepted the job before I had it. <laughs> and, um, you know, it was a horror, it was not a good job. It was not what I wanted to do with my life at all. Um, but it it let me get a sustainable, like build my career towards a sustainable design director position in New York City, which like that was that was 10 years of a chunk of my life that I loved and it was wonderful. I guess what would I do if I knew all of that? What would I do with all that information? I just would do exactly the same thing. I'm really like <laughs> have my own little practice. I'm doing work I love. I'm doing it with people I love. I just there's I it wasn't great. It definitely sucked, but I wouldn't change it. Right. Um, I think that is exactly what I would say too if I had to answer this question is <laughs> don't don't worry. Um, because all of these opportunities, even though they seem crazy, um, end up culminating in something that usually turns out pretty well. So don't get your heart set on um a certain path and then you can um and grow from there and there's so many opportunities yeah. in here so, so don't feel worried um Chad yeah. go ahead if you if you have <laughs> that uh yeah that's like I mean it's a tough question because you just <laughs> never know if you'd taken a different path I um I actually was uh it was right around the Lehman Brothers collapse and I was out at a party it was a gallery opening and I was chatting with Stephen Hall and he said, he thought I was basically trying to get a job at his firm. He's like, you know, talk to my person tomorrow and we'll hire you. And I was like, oh, well, this, you know, Stephen Hall is, is an amazing <laughs> architect. And I didn't pursue it because I was like, well, is, uh, should I like jump ship and switch? But I always wonder if I should have gone and worked <laughs> in his office. And uh, then I think, you know, the, he, his office also had layoffs. And who knows whether I wouldn't have been able to you know, hold on there. And so I, I, it's one of those like, uh, hindsight is 2020, except some of those forks in the road, you just really don't know what mm -hmm. would have happened otherwise. But kind of counter to that, I would say, um, I think I would have not worried as much and said yes to more things. And, mm -hmm. and also, I think I would have had more um, confidence and even uh, probably asked for for more from my employers. I think mm -hmm. the one thing that can happen in recessions is you um, kind of devalue your own worth as an employee and what you're bringing to the firm. And I think that there was kind of a, a lag effect where in 2010 and 11, I was not asking for raises and I was not pushing for promotions that I probably should have been. And um, I see the, the younger people graduating and how good they are at negotiating salary and, you know, <laughs> advocating for themselves. And I would say, you know, keep, keep, be polite, but keep, uh, believing in yourself and keep pushing for, for all, for your own advancement and career. Um, that's great advice. Thanks, Chad. Um, Karen. Yeah, I was going to say a similar thing, which is that I hope, you know, I've, I've heard, um, you know, the comment, take any job that you can. Um, and I think it's, it's, it's making sure to not um, have a sort of scarcity mindset. Um, you know, there might be different financial realities uh, for different people, um, but um, definitely if you are really desperate, don't tell anyone, <laughs> um, you know, uh, uh, and there's a book that I highly, 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 highly recommend called You Can Negotiate Anything. Um, anyway, so I negotiated. It's by, I'm going to look up the author, Cohen. It's very, very good. 
anyway, read that. But I, I certainly negotiated um, my position. I didn't actually have anything else, but I didn't tell them that. Um, I negotiated a significantly higher salary than I was offered. This was not in architecture, um, but you also don't have to take a job in architecture right now. Um, so, so what would I, so I'm thinking about two things. What would I do differently? Um, oh good, someone found it, thanks. Um, so what would I do differently? Um, I might have a different mindset within the job that I got. So yeah, so I got this job um, it was, it was, uh, federal money, you know, funneled through different things to do disaster planning on a regional scale. Um, and I was on the housing team and it was, um, I'm not sure if you said painful or something else, Jennifer, but it was painful. It was a painful couple of years. It was very <laughs> difficult to go from the lovely sort of collegial, like intellectual, beautiful space of GSAP into um, being, you know, in a hierarchical job um, run by emergency managers um, who think very differently. Um, they don't want to hear your theory. They, my boss would say over and over again, less words. Um, and, you know, all the existential, all the stuff that we were dealing with in school, I wasn't allowed to deal with that. Um, I was just meant to produce in a very particular way. Um, in a very different language. Um, and it was really painful. And I was like, how, you know, spending way too much of my own like psychic energy um, thinking about that conflict. Um, so, you know, you might also end up in a job that's not architecture and it might be difficult because you're going to have to work with people who don't think like you. Um, now, you know, looking back, uh, it's, it's really cool that I, it was horrible, <laughs> but I had the chance to, to learn how to uh, switch gears, to learn how to speak in different languages. So I wish that I could have thought of it more as a game um, and not taken it so personally um, and learn from that. And, and so that's something that I would do differently. I, you know, I, it, I took the job, it was a lot of money, it made sense, not a lot, but it was a lot compared to what my architecture friends were making. Um, so it, it made sense, but I would have operated differently within the job. And then I had one more thought to your previous question, Ruth, which mm -hmm. is that um, our old Dean, Mark Wigley, used to have some advice that I thought that was, help, was helpful, where you know it, it can be awkward sometimes to ask someone directly, will you hire me? Um, but he had a specific suggestion, which is to say, do you know anyone who's hiring? <laughs> so of course, if that person is hiring and wants to hire you, they will tell you, <laughs> but it doesn't put them on the spot and gives them the chance to tell you different people to approach. Um, that's great advice. Thanks, Karen. Uh, Randall? Yeah, uh, I guess I'm on the, you don't know what you don't know, I guess, of, of that camp. Mm -hmm. um, I, I do remember at the time I was debating on uh, whether I was going to stay in New York or move back to Boston, uh, where where I ultimately decided. So if I if I would have if I would have contemplated and where I stayed and what I ended up doing was great and it, it you know as 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 it all as everyone here it all worked out for the best. I still wonder if I would have just stayed in New York, how the story would have played out differently mm -hmm. for me. Um, there was just a different energy at the time, a different vibe. Um, and so even though I was, I wanted to go back to Boston, you know, I did it reluctantly. Interesting. Um, I think that's uh, a, another, uh, we're very New York centric um, coming from GSAP, but there are students from all over the country and all over the world. And it's um, interesting to think about how, um, they can use Columbia uh, as a sort of, obviously having that degree is a great jumping off point, but um, how they can use that to leverage um, getting their foot in the door anywhere in the world. Um, I guess uh, one thing I wanted to, that's gonna be my final question, um, but one question that I wanted to ask before that was, uh, since we're all architects on this panel, um, that there's a lot of, uh, I, I felt this, and I'm not sure if um, our students feel this right now, but I just wanted to ask this question. Um, there's a lot of pressure to follow um, a, a very specific pathway in getting 
in your professional career in terms of uh, internships, um, finding your um, mentor, uh, getting licensed, um, and starting your own firm. Um, I think definitely in the in the, I would say past ten years, things have changed a lot. Things have not changed a lot. Um, what would be your advice for that sort of thing? For example, um, I myself did get licensed a couple years ago. I have not used it at all. Um, and I don't plan on starting my own firm at this point, just because I, I really enjoy the co collaboration with uh, a larger team. Um, I don't, and I know that's a lot of, um, it invokes a lot of anxiety in a newer um, graduate. So I just wanted to get your advice about how you see that working in, um, in our industry in the future, like now and in the future. Um, I will switch it up a little bit. Uh, Chad, can we start with you? Well, I, um, I'm kind of traditional, I guess, in the fact that I did start my own firm and mm -hmm. um, I'm licensed. Um, I also live in San Francisco and I feel like uh, most of the architects that I know here are actually not architects. Um, they're, in, they're mostly working for tech companies, working for Google, working for um, Salesforce, um, and they're doing... Things, some, some of them are doing things related to aesthetics and related to design, but not, um, I don't know anyone, for instance, who's working for Apple, like designing their stores, um, but they do have those sort of things. Um, so I would say I feel fortunate that um, I've been able to do this, but I also don't think it's the easiest thing to do. And some of my, um, people that graduated with me who are working for Google, for instance, are like buying houses and, uh, you know, <laughs> they're financially better off than I am. Um, so it's also not necessarily like the most um, uh, profitable thing to be a small architecture firm, uh, even in a very good economy. You know, the economy in San Francisco in the last four years has been amazing. I mean, the amount of opportunities and it's been an amazing time to really um, start an architecture firm and grow and I'm I'm an optimist so I'm actually optimistic about even the next few years um, but it's uh, it's definitely not easy and it's um, I think it's something that is more you do it because you love it and not because it's the most logical thing to do <laughs> good point um, very good point uh, Karen, can we do you next? Uh, I think that you have an interesting um, situation that you're in right now, especially. Sure. Um, so my experience is that for me, once I stepped out of traditional architecture, so I did, I worked, you know, before GSAP between Berkeley and GSAP, I worked at a normal firm doing normal stuff. Um, uh, yeah, and then I had a normal internship at Rex. Um, of uh, my personal experience was that I stepped outside of architecture and then uh, I flirted a couple of times with going back into normal firm work, um, but I that did not make sense for me um, because I had a taste of getting paid properly <laughs> and um, <laughs> having more um, uh, um, authority than I would have in my early jobs. And so it just, you know, for me, I would have, um, if I had gone back to architecture and the, there were like a couple of moments where I really thought seriously about it and I was talking with firms, um, it would have meant for me personally, a pay cut. And um, also I, it would have been uh, difficult on the ego, I think, because I would have um, had less authority. So that was my personal experience. Um, and, you know, I, yeah, so I did that government thing for a bit and then I ran a nonprofit for a bit. And then, you know, I've been working, um, you know, before taking this fellowship, working basically in three areas, uh, teaching and um, writing. I edited a book called Housing as Intervention published by AD out of London. And then um, my work work has been collaborations with city agencies um, on, on projects that connect uh, design and health, uh, working in different capacities as an editor, as a project manager, as a 
make it happen person, whatever that means. Um, so, so, and now um, I am thinking about um, as different things collapse, I'm thinking about how I can, you know, it's like diversifying, right? So I'm thinking now about how to use that because things that have felt safe are no longer safe, right? Academia is supposed to be safe, um, but actually there are higher increases everywhere now, right? So I am thinking specifically for myself about, um, you know, uh, how I can use, I've accidentally <laughs> gotten a lot of experience. You know, I might go work for FEMA, honestly. So, so it's like, I have disaster housing. I have editorial, I have running nonprofit. I have, I don't even know all this stuff I've done. Um, not on purpose, but just because I've said yes to cool things. And so now I'm, I'm hoping, um, that that will be useful for me as different things close up. Great. Thank you. Um, yeah, Karen's had a, an interesting, um, path leading to her fellowship that she's uh, doing in Portland right now. Um, Randall, it would be great to have you chime in now. Sure. Um, well, my, my career has been in like three waves, kind of conscious pivots as I've gone through. I got my first degree in tradi did traditional architecture, got my license and registered pretty much the traditional way of doing things, worked at a small, small boutique um, design firm. I went, to, I went to Columbia and got my degree, my master's there, and I went back to a now what would become a much larger architecture firm. So I got the boutique experience and then I got the large firm experience. But it was in that place that I pivoted about 20 years ago uh, and ended up leaving architecture. Even though I'm a licensed architect, I ended up leaving um, uh, and getting involved in um, uh, working with clients like airlines and car companies and Disney and all kinds of entities and helping them think of a bigger, broader customer guest experience. And so it goes beyond just the physicality of the space and it gets into the behavioral and, and product offering and business model and everything that needs to go into creating something. Um, and what's funny is I've come across all kinds of architects in the business uh, that have have made a similar pivot. There's more, there's a lot of architecture. And so I guess the thing I would like to say is that the, the architectural education is pretty powerful. Um, it's, you know, got built into it, critical thinking. It's got built in into it, you know, complex problem solving. Uh, and so, you know, you can, you can use your degree, you can use your ability, and I use it all the time. It's even in my shtick a little bit about telling people that, you know, I treat every project that I get with my clients as an architectural project. Uh, and, uh, you know, we are the best thinkers out there. Uh, way before design thinking caught hold, we were, we were thinking that way. I love that. Um, and I think that's a really good way to approach anyone, a job uh, and clients. So thanks, Randall. I, I love that. Um, Jennifer. Yeah, I, I love what Rick said and, and what all the other panelists said. Um, the mindset of a task that I think we lock ourselves in is something I would encourage everybody to let go of. And, and I would phrase it a slightly different way, which is I think we all have some version of what success means, like what that word actually mm -hmm. means. And it might mean a lot of money. It might mean a couple of houses. It might mean like a big practice that, you know, sustains itself over generations. I don't know. It's all... Maybe it's all the same for all of us in the beginning and then it starts to diverge. I'm not exactly sure, but it took me a little while to actually figure out what success meant for me. And I had a, had a great job in New York City. I was, you know, leading teams um, in sustainable design, but I, I didn't, I didn't feel like it was what I wanted, but if I had like said to my, you know, person graduating from GSAP, this is what you're going to have in eight years, I'd be like, great, that's what I want. <laughs> but when you get it, it's, you sort of you get to do a little bit of a check and you're like, but this, this actually isn't a success for me. Um, and I scaled down my life and it's better. <laughs> um, and each person gets to make that choice. And I think what we do well as GSAP graduates, architects in general, is a lot of what Randall was saying, which is that we we can pivot and we can move and we can 
evolve and be super resilient just in our own spiritual self of like what makes us feel good about our work. Mm-hmm. Um, and you just got to keep tapping into that and you'll be fine, honestly, because you, if you're doing something you really care about, this, the work will come in some way. I mean, one of the pieces that I'm doing in addition to architecture is the Laurentia Project, which is about bringing designers together in really beautiful spots all over the country over really yummy food with different chefs. And we talk about process and we use food to talk about design process and we use food to talk about, um, you know, misogyny and femininity or social justice or whatever it might be. And Columbia gave me that foundation to be able to integrate all of that really beautiful thinking into outreach and building community. And it's not about architecture at all, but it's work I love and it feeds the work that I do as an architect. And I think we're, we're all given that gift as a graduate of the program. Um, that is perfect because I think that leads exactly into my next question, which is um, now that uh, this pandemic has hit, the, the way that, um, that we used to network and um, connect is totally different. So um, yeah. people can't go to parties, people can't go to lectures. Um, they, you know, ev- everything has thoroughly changed. So how, um, what do your digital communities look like now? Um, Jennifer's talking about how um, she uses these sort of dinner parties to kind of talk about everything design. And I think that it's important to figure out other um, solutions that are um, like solutions that are private, public, like how, what are your new digital communities and, and networking um, resources? Um, I'll, I'll start with, uh, I'll start with Karen. Um, I like to flirt with people through the chats in Zoom. <laughs> I'm only sort of joking. No, like literally yesterday I was, you know, I'm using flirt in like a sort of non-sexual way. Um, But I was on um, a big giant Zoom call yesterday that was awesome. Um, The architecture lobby put it on about the Green New Deal. It was amazing. Um, And I just started writing. I saw everyone I knew and I started writing little notes. And um, I'm not getting a job. I'm not looking for a job, but um, uh, you know, now I'm on someone's review next week, and then someone else ended up writing me, and we're having a little chat about something else. Um, so that's what I've been doing. That's chat great. flirting. That's that's great, um, and I think uh, the GSF has been great about organizing things like this so students can connect to alumni and each other. So um, feeling really grateful to be part of that community. Um, Randall, can we go to you next? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, you know, the the networks, what's what's interesting about this, and partly because I think, you know, a little bit of the monotony of being home 24-7, practically, <laughs> um, and, and being so hyper-dependent on sort of these Zooms and Skypes and everything is, what's really been interesting is I've been more social uh, to a broader <laughs> group of people than I ever thought. So, all these kind of people that some people I haven't talked to in 20 and 30 years are getting together and having Skypes and disparate groups of friends are getting together and we're having birthday parties from people in California to Maine to New York to wherever. And that part is kind of interesting, this hyper digital socialization that's evolved, which allows us to connect with people around the world that I guess we could have done this for a while and people were doing this, but not at the the scale and the familiarity that we're all becoming of this. Um, I wonder when we do get back to some sense of normal, how much of this will uh, maintain or will it just eventually bleed away a little bit? I I don't know. Um, I'm thinking it will maintain to some extent, but, but, I'm not sure. I think that's such a good point. <laughs> um, I had a similar thought along the similar lines where it's like, uh, because I live in California and a lot of my classmates from GSAP still live in New York or on the East Coast, I was really struck, especially a couple of weeks ago when I started having chats with people or there'd be like a get together with some alumni and, and um, I would be included in these discussions and these, uh, 
parties or whatever you want to call it that I think that they're having in person on a more regular basis, but they just happen to it because like, oh, let's invite Chad as well. Because we can, because he lives in San Francisco. Um, so I think that has been kind of, a, kind of a silver lining or kind of a surprising positive. Um, and I think that everyone's getting better at Zoom and more comfortable talking at a screen and also seeing their own face while they're talking at the screen and all these funny new things that we do. Um, but to you, back to your uh, original question, I think um, one challenge is that even though we are super connected, uh, I personally feel like I'm constantly on the phone these days and I'm constantly on Zoom. And mm -hmm. so even though we're isolated, um, you're kind of hyper-connected and clients know you're at home and you're not out at meetings, you're not out at the site. So people call you at any time. So I think it is a challenge, especially um, in a, on a social uh, level, it's good, but on a professional or you know, trying to interact with other professionals, I think it's a challenge in terms of figuring out the right um, level of informality versus formality mm -hmm. and like how to set up a meeting and how to let someone know that you want to show them your work, say you're trying to interview, but you're also not going to um, you know, take up two hours of their time when they're busy doing other things. So I think there is, I don't necessarily have the answer for people, but I think that there's, um, part of it is letting people know if you are trying to connect with them on a professional level, that you're respectful of their time and that you're, um, you're going to kind of respect some of those boundaries, even though you're there at their house and you're at your house, you know, kind of <laughs> how you no negotiate that is, is interesting. I think. Uh, that's a really good point. We don't want to overwhelm people with digital fatigue. So um, thanks, Chad. <laughs> um, Jennifer, if you have anything else to add to um, the things that you're already doing and mentioned to us, that'd be great. Yeah, just really short. Uh, I mean, I, my office is my office has been digital since its beginning. So we're in different locations, New York City, Vermont, and New Jersey. So the this current change hasn't been a change for us. Um, which I have always in these last few weeks felt like, well, this is a sign of um, our adaptability and resilience and, and something to feel good about. But it's it's hard to feel good about what's happening right now. Um, but I would say as an introvert, which I imagine a lot of us on this call are, it's um, it's really important to be alone <laughs> and to have a really beautiful space to be alone and give yourself that and don't ask for any kind of, um, don't apologize for like needing space to be alone. And I would encourage people to do non-digital communication. Um, I haven't had a chance to do it yet, but like writing somebody a letter and having something arrive in their mailbox right now in this period of time would be just like a hug, the best as we can get <laughs> to a hug. I would, I would recommend to turn off your devices and take a pen and select some really beautiful paper and a really beautiful envelope and send somebody a letter. Going back to um, actually mailing work samples again, uh, interesting. <laughs> I have Thanks a couple more things if I can. Yeah. Um, so, so one sort of anecdote. So yeah, so I'm in this very funny position, you know, I moved across the country. There are six of us who moved here, right, to be visiting fellows. And a big draw was to get to know um, existing faculty. And now we're all in our living rooms. Um, so one of you know, some of my fellow fellows were saying, oh, no, that's, that's lost. That's fully lost. Um, so we've, but instead, you know, we're turning the tables and we would usually, we're sort of, we're visiting, right? So usually we're just accepting invitations, but now um, we're, we're going to have our own sort of digital coffees where we're inviting in um, the, the permanent faculty who normally would have been inviting us. Um, I'm sort of, it's funny because I'm a super extrovert and I, uh, it's not uncommon for me to be at three events in one night, literally in New York. Um, but I actually have been hating all these Zoom things that I've been saying no to most of them. Um, but, but then I'm thinking about a couple of things that, or maybe three things that um, 
uh, I do consistently um, and how they might operate in our new world. So one is, um, you know, going up to people who are way too intimidating and just doing it anyway. Um, and I think that can work. It's maybe it's a little bit easier now in some ways because you can shoot them a chat um, where there's not going to be like a line at the lecture. Um, so often I am not comfortable, for instance, um, it's very uncomfortable for me to ask a question in a public forum. Um, and therefore I just, I force myself to do that often. And I just say, you know, you have to, something has to come out of your mouth, Karen. Um, so again, like seeing it as a game, um, and, and doing that has been really productive in a lot of ways. And then a couple of things, um, that are sort of basic, but in case it's helpful for anyone, um, you know, people love compliments and they love to be asked for advice. Um, so, so um, using that as an approach to people, um, uh, you know, maybe not saying, will you give me a job, but what would be your advice? I'm looking for this kind of thing. What would be your advice on how to go about doing that? It's more, it's like oblique, but it, it will actually probably get you to your goal faster. Um, and then also like ending each conversation with who else do you think I should talk to? Um, so those are, those are really boring basics, um, but some things that I think can still exist fine digitally. Totally, and a extension of uh, Mark Wigley's advice, I like that. Um, we have a, a question from a student and um, it's a good one. Uh, Maria was asking, how do you see the freelance field since it's one of um, the options during these times? And do you see work in that area and how would you approach um, how would you approach looking for it? Um, can we start with Randall? I would like to hear your advice. Um, well, uh, in my world, the freelance world is a big part of it. Uh, mm -hmm. And there is, uh, there is a, a, you know, it, it's, a, it's pretty kind of a gig economy anyway with groups coming together, big groups, small groups. And we, we, we employ a lot of freelance tech uh, help there are a lot of platforms out there now for freelance, uh, and you do see architecture positions um, list, listed on them. Not not a lot, but um, um, there are um, platforms that you can uh, present yourself and jobs, people looking for freelance work. Um, I, I've seen it, and I've seen requests specifically in architecture. Uh, but just also in general design issues, design problems. But um, yeah, uh, it's. I think the best way to do it is to find the the, the appropriate platform uh, that works for you, and and that's how people are are hiring their freelancers now. Great, um, Randall. If you have some of those resources that maybe we can call from you, that would be amazing. Sure, I can put together some of those. Sure. Awesome. Thank you. Um, Chad, uh, since you are in your own firm and, um, well, it's not a freelance thing, but like you started off the, I'm sure that way, how, what would you be your advice here? You're on mute, sorry. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Um, I think, well, it kind of is related, but maybe a little bit different is, um, we've started talking about uh, digital internships or remote internships for the summer because we actually don't know what the travel situation will be and we don't know what, um, you know, the stay at home orders will be in California in the next couple months. And so even the people that we were planning to hire as interns may be in sort of a somewhat of a freelance um, capacity because they may just be working from, you know, where they are currently. Um, so I think um, there, even if uh, I think it's 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 one option to just approach architecture firms and say, hey, you, you may not know what your um, you know next six months are like, but we're open to doing remote kind of freelance work. Um, if you're doing it on a um, stipend or it's like a you know a, tr a true internship and you're not in the office you're not using the office's computers 
you have to have a certain amount of independence, which I think freelance work always has, where you're kind of you're taking a piece of work and then doing it. Um, and that takes an additional set of skills. Um, you know, your own, you have to be more self-directed and you have to um, know how to kind of almost pitch a project, I guess, <laughs> or, you know, kind of take a piece uh, at a time and you don't get the same feedback that you would if you were in the office and you're having a discussion every day. Um, so I think it's even, even at architecture firms, there may be some pseudo freelance situations going forward. Great. Yeah. It's a, that's an interesting. I'm sure this is ever evolving, but that's an interesting way to, to approach um, traditional firms too. Um, Jennifer, do you have any advice in this uh, situation, like a uh, freelance? I do. It's going to be boring. Um, all of my all of my staff are contracted, so they're all freelance, and they and we like it that way. Yeah, and they like it that way, and it keeps everybody really flexible. Um, you know, one of my client, one of my staff is, is raising two young kids, and it allows her to kind of manage her own time exactly how she needs it to be, and it, it works really well. The boring part is before you do it, just make sure you understand the difference between a 1099 and a W-2 or W-9. Sorry, I get it wrong. And talk to a tax professional or an accountant or a friend who understands finance just to know what it means when they say self-employment tax because it's a lot of money. It's 45% yeah. income typically which is a lot more than you get when you're an employee, when you're not a, when you're not a freelance. So ask for more money so that you can cover the fact that you're paying more taxes, you're paying social security and you're paying for Medicare. Okay. Boring, um, but really. That is great, <laughs> great, boring advice. Yes. No, no, the difference. Um, <laughs> thank you, Jennifer. Um, Karen. I like the part where you're like, okay, listen to me. <laughs> um, no, that's helpful. Um, yeah, so so I'm realizing that, you know, there are, it's true, once in a while I am strategic. Um, so when I was when I was wanting to move from leading the Institute for Public Architecture to doing my own work, I knew that I wanted to um, do more and more work uh, connecting design and health equity. Um, and so what that looked like was um, a million coffees, uh, where I was, you know, uh, figuring out, you know, the, the question I had was to figure out what does the landscape look like? Who's doing interesting work at the intersection of design and health? Um, so that's how I got my foot in the door, uh, doing what ended up being, has ended up being like a ton of awesome, um, contract work with city agencies, et cetera. It started by, um, yeah, meeting with everyone who I was told was cool, doing cool work in that area, um, and then having very, making it easy for them, you know, being super clear, you know, these are the things that I can do. I can do editorial, I can do da 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 da. So they're not, so they're not lost, you know, both in the way you present yourself and whatever your CV says, like super clear where they can fit you and what you're interested in. So for me, it was that combination where someone needed an editor and, and that was the start of, of that. And then um, an anecdote from one of your classmates, Ruth, um, who cold called, you know, this is, this is pre-COVID, so who knows, but she would cold call um, firms and say, hey, I'm interested in doing just, you know, this many hours a week. And she found that firms were quite receptive. This is architecture firms because they hadn't thought, they were, didn't feel ready to post a full job because they didn't have enough work for that. And so, and maybe they felt awkward about posting for 15 hours a week, whatever she was looking for. Um, but when she proposed that, they thought, huh, you know, I am sort of on the fence. We could commit to 15 hours a week. Um, come on in. So she, she had a lot of luck that way. That's um, great advice. And, uh, and with all of this, um, be careful that you make sure that you get what you're worth um, and don't undercut yourself. Um, if uh, anyone has any other questions, 
please put it in the chat. Otherwise, I'm going to end with one last question. Um, so I want to kind of tie this back to GSAP. How did you feel that GSAP, like the clout of GSAP helped you in shaping your future? I know this is a very broad question, but like specifically in getting your foot in the door professionally um, as you moved forward. Um, I'm going to start with Chad. <laughs> Um, I think, uh, you know, it, it helped in getting my first job out of GSAP because um, it was a direct connection. Um, Marcus wasn't an alumni, but he was uh, about to be teaching at a studio at GSAP. So it was his connection to the school. Um, when I started the practice we have now, um, literally our second client at the first um, interview said, well, I see from your resume that, you know, you went to a good school. So she was kind of judging based on Columbia. And I thought that was a little bit funny at the time, but um, it does, people do pay attention to those things. So it's something to just, hopefully it boosts your confidence. I, in my experience, um, Columbia grads don't actually um, kind of tout it as much as some other um, East Coast Ivy League schools do, <laughs> and I think we should. Um, so uh, don't be shy about it. It's uh, it's definitely a feather in your cap. And it's something to be proud of, and um, and just kind of make sure it's a part of your resume and that people are aware of the, your excellent education. Awesome, thank you. Um, I think this is also an interesting question, just because uh, Career Services has expanded so much at GSAF, so. Um, you have an amazing resource there. Uh, so kind of cold calling and doing it just with our resume was how we had to do it before. Um, can I ask uh, Randall next um, how you use GSAP to kind of... Uh, I totally agree with, with that. I mean, uh, uh, having Columbia, being associated with uh, Columbia Graduate School of Architecture, um, even, even in my world, still carries a lot of uh, clout. I mean, it's it's recognized both from a from a legacy standpoint, but also because of some of the great academics that have come through there. And you know, I guess the being able to, you know, um, when I was, you know, I've run into Bernard Schumi on the streets of New York, and it, you know, it's still nice to have those connections and those exposures that we had over the years. That you know. We can go and talk with um, all kinds of people, uh, in part because of the people we've met at Columbia, both the the academics and even the the, the students who go on to do great things, whether they become mu museum curators or whatnot. Awesome, thank you, um, Karen. Can we uh, have you weigh in? Sure. Um, I mean, I've recently appreciated more. The degree to which, um, you know, my sort of GSAP community has acted as a passport. Um, and most recently, I, um, I organized a whole like speaking tour, research tour, awesome time for myself in Argentina and Chile, mm -hmm. um, uh, just through GSAP Connections, Augustine Chang. Um, I was lucky to be in the GSAP incubator in its last um, year. Um, so he was instrumental um, in helping me to, to set up those connections. So realizing that actually I, I'm a couple of degrees away from like a bajillion countries around the world has been um, pretty awesome. Great. Um, Jennifer would love your input too. Yeah, it's, it's definitely a matter and it's, it's worth the effort and like for those, I'm gonna talk about money again because I just think we don't talk about money enough as architects and we're not good at it or at least I'm not. <laughs> I try and help people be better at it. But um, if any of you are like scared about your loans or thinking like, what did I just get myself into? <laughs> and like into this economy that I'm launching myself in, um, you know, it the money is worth it. It really does pay itself over time and it continues to pay itself over time. It's not just about the first job you get out of school. It's the clients who look at your, your CV when they're looking at your portfolio and you're applying for a project for your firm. 
it matters and it, and it gets you far. So it, don't ever feel like you didn't invest in something absolutely valuable you did. Awesome, thank you. Thank you so much to the panel. Um, we've been pretty lucky that everyone here is from a different part of the, of the US. So, um, but we also have uh, alumni all over the world and you guys know that and we have been able to personally interact with them and go abroad. So um, in this time, make sure that you um, feel free to connect to anyone that you have in your network. Um, it's a big one. Uh, so Leslie um, Kuo, who started the, the whole um, uh, meeting today, she is able to connect you to any alumni around the world and she is fantastic. So please use her um, as much as you can. Uh, her um, her email is lek2162, and I'm sure you can find it through the GSAP office too. Uh, 